chapter 4, text 22, which comes of a don accord, who is free from duality and does not envy, who is steady in both success and failure, is never agitated, is never entangled, although performing actions. Purport. A Krishna conscious person does not make much endeavor even to maintain his body. He is satisfied with gains which are obtained of their own accord. He neither begs nor borrows, but he labors honestly as far as is in his power, and is satisfied with whatever is obtained by his own honest labor. He is therefore independent in his livelihood. He does not allow anyone's service to hamper his own service in Krishna consciousness. However, for the service of the Lord, he can participate in any kind of action without being disturbed by the duality of the material world. The duality of the material world is felt in terms of heat and cold or misery and happiness. A Krishna conscious person is above duality because he does not hesitate to act in any way for the satisfaction of Krishna. Therefore, he is steady both in success and in failure. These signs are visible when one is fully in transcendental knowledge. He who is satisfied with gain which comes of its own accord, who is free from duality and does not envy, who is steady in both success and failure, is never entangled, although performing actions. <clears throat> so here is a very important point, which often we forget about uh, when we are endeavoring in our Krishna conscious activities, is that one should be satisfied of gain, with gain which comes of its own accord. <clears throat> and that is a very difficult kind of a judgment to make. When is an action over endeavor? And when is an action or the result of an action coming out of its own accord? And here in this class, I don't think we would be able to pin down some kind of formula which we should follow that so much endeavor, when the endeavor meter goes here, then the red light starts flashing. Too much endeavor because it's not necessarily able to be understood in that way. Sometimes, for instance, something will come very easily. And one will think that maybe this is what Krishna wants. Of course, maybe it came easily because that's what Maya wants. Or something may be very, very hard, and one will think, well, maybe Krishna doesn't want it. But maybe it's because Maya doesn't want it. So it's very hard to understand at what point to draw the line. For instance, Prabhupada, when he was wanting to get this Bombay land, everybody else said, don't do it. One devotee was continuously trying to thwart the plan of Prabhupada to get that land in various ways because he thought it was a terrible idea. And others were also trying to thwart that plan. What to speak of the person who wanted to cheat everybody, cheat Prabhupada. Right. So every indication was, don't get it. Every indication was, don't buy it. Get off. Go away. But the fact was that Krishna wanted it. It's like if you're Arjuna, of course you'll never be Arjuna, but just like Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, when he is faced with millions of people who want to kill him. Certainly, it was not easy to engage in that battle. So, uh, it was very difficult. So, should one say it was an over-endeavor? Because somebody's shooting arrows at you, the result is not coming easily. All the enemies, they just don't fall over just because you look at them. So, is it an over-endeavor? No, because Krishna wanted it done. So here's a rule. If Krishna wants it done, no matter what it takes to do it, you should do it. If it's the order of the spiritual master, no matter what it takes to do it, you should do it. 
even if you think it's an over-endeavor. But it's not so. Some disciples thought it was an over-endeavor to buy Hare Krishna land. Others thought, if Prabhupada wants to buy it, then we should work for it. Luckily, there were more who were willing to work for it than against it. But the point was that that is a determining factor. If Prabhupada wanted, we would do. If he didn't want, we wouldn't do. That is a determining factor. Not the difficulty it took to attain it. The factor was the desire of the spiritual master in Krishna. So that is a very, very important factor. The most important factor. Now someone may ask, well, what about in other activities where I may not have a direct instruction like that? Maybe I've got to perform a certain activity. And I'm endeavoring, endeavoring, and it's just simply not working. Does that mean I should be satisfied if it worked automatically and not endeavor anymore? No, because it's not the question of the ease of the activity that counts. It's the question of the authorization of the activity. For instance, if one is asked to build something out of wood, well, some things can be pretty tricky. Something little or something complicated, it can be very tricky. So, it's not going to be easy, even for an expert. It's not that just because you're expert, things are easy. They're also hard, but one is more able to do it. So, if it is authorized, then one should do, because the authorization is there. And even if it's very, very hard, you should keep on doing it. So, this authorization idea is very important. That if one is acting under some superior authority, then his activities, even if they're complicated or difficult, are actually not over-endeavor. But if one is acting out of his own desire, then of course, this kind of a rule would be very valuable. And if one is acting under higher authority, this understanding is also very valuable. If one is satisfied with gain that comes of its own accord, then one is quite satisfied. If one is working for gain which comes to Krishna for his satisfaction, then even if one's working very hard, to overcome the disturbances and obstacles thrown by the material nature, one will also be very happy. But if one had to work like that for himself, then he wouldn't be at all very satisfied. And he would want more from his endeavor. He would think, I've worked so hard and I got so little. This is not good. But if you work very, very hard for Krishna and you accomplish whatever you can, Still, that's satisfying that something has been accomplished, although one would want to do more for Krishna. So, for his personal self, if something comes here, he does not have to go out of his way to accomplish something or gain something for his personal self. But for the sake of Krishna, he can try to accomplish everything on the planet. So, the difference is how much you do for Krishna, what you do for Krishna. If you can, do it nicely for Krishna's satisfaction. That is the difference. So, in our Krishna consciousness movement, we endeavor like that. There are certain rules in Upadesha Amrita, Achahara Prayashastha, Pajapa, Niamagraha, Janasangastha, Lolyam Cha, Sadhvivaktir, Pushidati, Vinashiti. These six things are very bad for spiritual life. Achahara Praya. Prayasha, achaha, too much collecting, too much eating, prayasha, too much endeavoring for a mundane result. So, these things are there in our Krishna consciousness that we should avoid doing things which are very, very difficult to attain for some mundane result. If there is some mundane result, we should be very, very careful that we should not endeavor very hard to attain that result. 
for us, we don't even want to work for a mundane result. A real devotee is not interested in doing even the slightest thing if it's for a mundane result. He couldn't care less. But if it's something transcendentally pleasing to the senses of Krishna, then he's very eager to do it. He's eager to endeavor for that which is pleasing to Krishna. But for that which is not pleasing to Krishna, he's not interested in doing it at all. That is the position of a devotee. He's eager to serve Krishna's senses. So for him, over-endeavor means to do that which is not satisfying to Krishna. And, of course, the word over-endeavor is relative. What may be over-endeavor for you is not over-endeavor for me. But, if it's not for the satisfaction of Krishna, whatever it is, it's an over-endeavor. Even if it's so easy. Still, it's an over-endeavor if it's not for Krishna's satisfaction. So a Krishna conscious person doesn't make endeavors for things which are for himself, but he makes endeavors for Krishna's satisfaction, but for himself he accepts whatever comes easily. This is never accepted in the material world. Prabhupada says he's a Krishna conscious person does not make much endeavor even to maintain his body. He is satisfied with gains which are obtained of their own accord. He neither begs nor borrows, but he labors honestly as far as, as far as in his power and is satisfied with whatever is obtained by his own honest labor. Extremely difficult principle. Nowadays, people are never satisfied. They always want more and more. Therefore, there are unions strikes, troubles, riots, revolutions, wars, because people want more. They're not satisfied with what they've got. They always want more. They always want to enjoy more. So therefore, we find Krishna conscious people are different because actually they're satisfied with whatever they get. That is a nice principle about a Krishna conscious person. If he gets something, he's pleasantly surprised. But if he needs something, he should get. That's our principle. If you need something, you should get it, of course. And when one gets that which he needs, he's very satisfied. He's got. What does he need more of? In fact, sometimes when you get too much, it becomes a big burden. And it's like uh, we have seen... I don't mind us saying, but sometimes when the householders are moving from one locality to another, <laughs> the amounts of garbage is incredible. <laughs> Just things piled on things, unpiled on things, and nobody could figure out what you would use these things for. They're just things, and we've got to have our things, so the things move from here to there. We've never really understood this thing business. <laughs> for those who live in a suitcase, it's, these piles of things are hard to understand. But uh, people think like that, that they must have many things, then they'll be happy. But when one is actually understanding, he realizes that the more things I pile up, the more annoyance there is, the more problem there is, the more these things become a burden, which cause me trouble. And what to speak of that? Why should I endeavor like anything to get more things? I had to work hard to get more things. It's really funny. Therefore, Krishna conscious man doesn't require things. Yes, he will require a heater in his room. Yes, he will require water in the bathroom. Yes, he will require clothes on the back. Yes, he will require shoes on the feet. Yes, these are requirements. But to have four different kinds of shoes. Some people, they have ten different kinds of shoes. What to speak of ten? I... I probably am so naive. <laughs> yeah. Probably they have 50 different changes of clothes. All of them unwashed. <laughs> 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 and a Krishna conscious person requires two or three dhotis and kurtas. Yeah? That's all. What more does he need? Of course, Sankirtan clothes, all right, so then we make a change and wash them frequently. So, uh, but materialists, 
he has to always look very snazzy. Many, many different sets of clothes. Because he thinks that these things, they make his identity. But actually, because of that, he has to sell himself to somebody else in order to make more and more money, in order to supply more and more things that he enjoys. But a Krishna conscious person is not like that. Therefore, he's independent. The material society cannot uh, capture him with anchors because he doesn't require things. He doesn't require huge income. He doesn't require any income because he knows that which I need I get in my service. After all, it's just common sense. We want everybody to go on serving enthusiastically, so if we don't feed you, you stop serving and go away. It's very utilitarian. We want you to be Krishna conscious, so therefore we know if we don't feed you, you'll get very upset and go away. So we feed you. If, if you need some clothes, it's too cold out, you don't have sufficient clothes and you're cold, well then, you'll not be able to do anything for Krishna's service, and if you don't do anything for Krishna's service, you won't make any advancement, so we give you clothes. It's very utilitarian. Utility is the principle. What you require, you take. This is actual communism. In the so-called pseudo, in the, in the pseudo-communistic society, they don't have the faintest idea what communism is. Because they're doing the exact same thing. Eating, sleeping, mating, defending, economic development. Actually, only in ISKCON is there anything close to communism, what real communism is. Even in ISKCON, there's plenty of capitalism. But there's more communism here than anywhere else. Everybody takes what they need from the temple, and they go out and they do what they can do and support the temple. And in this way, it's very communistic. Nobody's got too much. We don't require. What we need for our service, we take. If we have bigger requirement for service, we take more things. Some people, they only require a pen, so we give them a pen. Some people, they require huge printing presses, so we give them huge printing presses. It just depends on your requirement. And we are all so communistic that we think, yes, all I need is a pen, I'll take a pen. He needs a big press, so he should take a press. And we don't get envious. Oh, why don't I get a press too? <laughs> oh, we say, okay, you want a press too? Go ahead, there's one. You can be, you take it too. You share it, okay? Make nice books for profit. What you need, you get. And you give more than you've got. This is very good communistic principle. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we even give more than you need. If you want to eat too much, you can do that. <laughs> and if you want to serve too much, you can do that too. We give facility. Plenty of activity are there. Too many activities. So one has got all kinds of facilities to serve Krishna very nice. Everything's there. Therefore, Krishna conscious society is nice. For those who actually have a taste for this kind of renunciation, Krishna conscious society is very nice because it allows them to live very peacefully and free. Very freely and peacefully. Uh, because there's nothing to worry about. If you don't have anything, there's nothing to lose. Now, a person in Krishna consciousness is independent. Independent means that he's not depending on others for his sense gratification since he has nothing to gain from sense gratification. Therefore, he's not depending on other persons to supply him anything for sense gratification. Whereas persons who are dependent on others for sense gratification always have to somehow act in such a way to get that from that other person. Either you have to pay that person to give you sense gratification, or you have to flatter that person, or you have to do so many things. It's like in the material world where people are so dependent on others. A man so dependent on woman, he will go out and act even like a complete fool just to attract the attention of some woman. <clears throat> Wasting his whole day. You see in the, in the materialistic society, everywhere you see man and woman going. And what are they doing? 
nothing of value. Just the woman talks something stupid, and the man has to go, yes, dear, yes, dear. Then the man does something stupid, and the woman goes, oh, how nice, or she goes, oh, you're a fool, or whatever. And all day long, they're just busy interacting with each other. And what do they accomplish? Absolutely nothing, except they spend a lot of money. And therefore, on Monday morning, he's got to go to work. And therefore, he's lost all of his independence, because he's completely dependent for sense gratification on someone of the opposite sex. That's all, for having sex less. Because that's all there is. In the material world, that's his whole goal. Therefore, he's completely dependent. And he's lost all freedom. So long as one has got dependency on sense gratification, he has no freedom. He's bound up, hand and foot. So long as one has got some desire for material enjoyment, He's chaining himself to the material world. And when one can give up that intense desire for material enjoyment, then he becomes free, actually free. Actually free. Our regulative principles, not only the four regulative principles, but the 64 regulative principles, and on top of that, the 128 regulative principles, and the unlimited amount of principles we have that regulate our lives, all of these regulative principles combine together provide a system of freedom because you don't have to speculate about all of these mundane things. A materialist, because at any moment he can do whatever he wants for material enjoyment, always has to speculate, what shall I do? We Just consider how free a devotee is because he doesn't smoke cigarettes, he doesn't chew chewing gum, he doesn't drink beer and he doesn't do all these things. When he's going somewhere, he just leaves one place and enters into another place. But the materialist has 8,000 choices to make as he's walking down the street. Shall I eat this or shall I drink that? Shall I smoke this or shall I chew this? And all of the advertisements catch his sight because these are things which are relevant to him. Smoke this. Oh yes, I smoke something, so maybe I should smoke that. Chew this, okay, well, I chew things all the time, maybe I should chew that. But for a devotee who doesn't chew this or that, and doesn't smoke this or that, or drink this and that, these things mean nothing to him. He may check out the graphics on the sign sometimes. (laughs) But beyond that, he doesn't get involved, because he's got nothing to be attracted to. (laughs) We always find ourselves proofreading and (laughs) criticizing the layout and all kinds of things. Anyway, it keeps us sharp, but besides that. (laughs) So, a materialist, his idea is that everything is meant for his sense gratification. Therefore, the other materialists know that perfectly well and they know how to capture him. Hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. Come on, try this out. Oh, check this out. And he's always very eager to be involved in these things because he's attracted. He wants. He likes. So this is materialistic life. It means that you're bound up hold in the nose with the hook and very sensitive there so you can be pulled this way, that way for the bull. That's the way you control him. Yeah. And the human beings, they have all these hooks in their different senses which are just pulled this way and that way and the other way all over the place. So, the thing that must be understood is that freedom is attained when one is actually Krishna conscious. Beyond that, there's no freedom. It's all bondage from top to bottom, hand and foot. Just as long as we have to search after some sense gratification, so much time we are spending in misery. And we all have experience, as soon as we have to run out and get sense gratification, we're immediately miserable. The same minute, the same minute you start endeavoring for sense gratification, you become miserable. And that is a fact and everybody experiences it. One may be very blissful and then all of a sudden the mind tricks him like a rascal. The mind is such a rascal. It just says, think of this, do this, want that. And immediately one becomes captured by the material energy. So, in order to avoid all these things, one has to be very, very, very careful. But on one's own, how do you avoid? It's not possible. Therefore, These regulative principles are there by which one can guide 
have his life guided for him. We don't have to speculate, shall I get up today at this time, or shall I get up today? What day of the week is today? Saturday. Oh, I think I'll get up at 10. Oh, Sunday, I'll get up at 2 in the afternoon. Uh, oh, it's Monday. Well, I have to get up at 6. Uh, or the, it's speculating like that. Or uh, maybe I'll eat at this time and that time and this time too and that time and a snack here and a box of this there and a can of that here. All day long, chewing. People are just in the material world, They're just chewing constantly. Totally unregulated. When they want something to eat, they go to the cupboard, pull out the box and chew. Open up the refrigerator, stick that thing in the can and drink. All day long. All the time, mind agitated. As soon as the tongue has a little tickle on it, immediately run for the cupboard. Soon as the tongue has a little tickle on it, they can't even tolerate for two minutes not chewing. Or else... Got to have another cigarette. Nervous like anything. You see them on the airplane. You know, when the no smoking sign is there, they're just... <laughs> the second it goes off, <laughs> in the mouth. Then they're like... <sighs> as if this was happening. Yeah. Horrifying. And yet, everybody accepts this as very nice. So, because of that, suffering is going on. And devotees get no problem. He just sits there. Okay. What is the difference? About to take off, landing. What is the difference? For the materialist, every moment there's another opportunity to enjoy, especially when they bring out all of the dead animals in the rolls, <laughs> rotting dead corpses, and they feed them to everybody. People think, oh, dead corpses, very good. <laughs> Excellent. In this way, life is going on. So, one should understand these points. He should be able to see the material world with the proper eye. He should actually examine and see how foolish people are and how dragged they are from here to there to everywhere simply because their senses are uncontrolled and unregulated. And actually, the whole material world is suffering under that illusion. Therefore, Pallad Maharaj said, So te tatovi mukhim, te tasa indiyata mayasakaya baramudva hatovi mudan. I'm simply worrying about all these fools and rascals who all day long are searching after maya sukaya, the illusory happiness of the material world. And they're not getting anything out of it except more suffering. It states in the Bhagavatam, in the sixth canto, about this, this concept that. The more you try to enjoy, the more suffering comes upon you. This problem is very deep. That every time one reaches out for sense gratification, he gets in return suffering. Maybe not immediately, but within a short time. And one never understands how it is. And even intelligent people relate the two. Intelligent people, they relate to two things. Unintelligent people, they never relate the two. They don't understand how this sense gratification I'm embracing is causing me to directly suffer. They don't think like that. And intelligent people, they understand that. Therefore, they avoid these things. Such persons have the opportunity to attain the mode of goodness. And from the mode of goodness, they can take up transcendental consciousness. Evam prasana manaso bhagavad bhakti yoga taha bhagavad tattva vijnana mukta sangas. From that point of clarity of the mind that comes from the mode of goodness, one is capable of elevating higher to the transcendental platform. First, one must come to the mode of goodness. And that's very important because when you can come to the mode of goodness, then there's all possibility of actually understanding the Supreme. From that platform of the mode of goodness, then one can understand Krishna. And in the mode of goodness, one is not searching after all day long sense gratification. He's looking for knowledge. And even something which is generally considered ignorant is the cause of development of knowledge of one who's in the transcendental position. Even something which is generally considered negative, ignorant, useless, nonsense, 
For such a person in knowledge, even that is capable of expanding his realization. He may see something and realize perfectly well, this material world is insane. Actually, every intelligent man understands that. This material world is completely insane. But in order to save themselves from that, the materialists, they make themselves all kinds of havens in the material world where their own little thing goes on in their own little place. And in this way, they think they're safe. But then no, no one's safe. In this material world, no one's safe. Nobody's safe. Because this material world is definitely insane. Especially nowadays. Nowadays, it's more insane than it's ever been in history. And it's only getting worse day by day. So therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is meant for intelligent class of men. Of course, when we look around the room, we may be wondering who that intelligent class was supposed to have been. But it is a fact that if you are surrendered to Krishna, automatically, by definition, you are of the intelligent class. Now, within intelligent class, there are degrees too. But we have seen that even the simplest devotee understands more about the basic principles of life, the basic reality of existence, than even a big, sophisticated professor in the university. Yes, that's a fact. Even the simplest devotee understands things which even big, big learned people don't have a chance to understand. Even if you simply understand one thing, that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and you are His eternal servant, you have just understood more than 99.99% of all intelligent people on this planet. And that is actual intelligence. Because if you do anything else, it ends up in degradation, descent into the lower species, or continuous rebirth, and if one just simply understands that and acts on it, he goes back home, back to Godhead, back to the spiritual sky in pure bliss. Therefore, there's nothing to worry about if you're in Krishna consciousness movement. And we are, so let us not worry. Let us be Krishna conscious, chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. Hare. And make our lives sublime. Hari. Yes.